A homemade bomb ripped through a rural home. And investigators had no idea who was responsible. The device was made with common items found in any store. But a tiny battery number and the label inside a computer uncovered a bizarre tale of revenge. The tiny town of Fairhaven, Vermont, is about as far removed from big city life as any place in the country. Violence was virtually unheard of, but even so, locals used to joke that Sheila Rockwell and her 17-year-old son, Chris Marquis, lived in the safest place in town, about 100 feet away from the police station. But all of that changed one March afternoon in 1998. was a knock on the door, it was the UPS man. And he had handed me a package. Hi, I'm package and I looked at the package and the package had said, um, Samantha Brown on it. Well, it didn't ring a bell to me because I don't know who any Samantha Brown was. So I brought it in to Chris. We got a package here. Chris was sitting at his desk in his bedroom and Samantha he didn't Brown. know a Samantha Brown either. He opened the box. Inside was a smaller box wrapped with string. He cut the string and there was an explosion. And I did realize that I was hit because my fingers were gone. Um, I tried crawling to Chris because he was moaning. And that's when I realized that my knee wasn't there and that I couldn't get to him. Chief Ray Vigor heard the explosion and ran over to investigate. Walked down this little corridor to, to, uh, into the living room, and then we could see some stuff coming out of the hallway there, and young Chris was laying on a, right there in the hallway, half in the room, half out. Both Sheila and Chris were rushed to the hospital. A large piece of the shrapnel, in this case, uh, went towards uh, Christopher Marquis's leg and essentially blew a large hole in his thigh and severed his femoral artery, and he bled to death. I kept asking, where, where is Chris? Where is Chris? How is Chris doing? And Dr. Hartman came in, and he put his hand on mine, and he said, Sheila, Chris didn't make it. And I can remember just letting out a scream, and then they had you know, put me under. The shrapnel found at the bomb scene indicated it was a pipe bomb, the favorite device of amateur bombers. Tiny brass hex nuts had been wrapped around the bomb to make it even more deadly. It's a terrible circumstance of violent crime that somebody just hooks up with the wrong person at the wrong time and becomes the victim of this kind of outrageous activity. The return address on the package said, Samantha Brown from Basiris, Ohio. When police checked the name and address, they found both were fictitious. Chris Marquis was a 17-year-old high school dropout, a loner. Because of an eye condition, he was slowly going blind. He spent most of his time indoors, and he had few friends. Yet someone clearly wanted to kill him. But who? As police looked into his background, they found Chris had a secret life, something his family knew nothing about. As police combed through the wreckage of Chris Marquis's bedroom, they had one question. Who wanted him dead? The package was shipped from Ohio and was addressed to the CB Shack in care of Chris Marquis. It was a small business Chris ran out of his home, selling citizen band radios and parts through the internet. 
Well, it wasn't really a business. It was mainly local people. You know, friends of his that he would fix their radio or people would hear him on the radio, probably bragging and telling him how he could fix radios, you know. And it was pretty much the locals. But investigators soon discovered that Chris Marquis didn't always treat his customers fairly. I think it's fair to say that Christopher Marquis was not completely honest in all of his business dealings with other people prior to his murder. Chris Marquis made enemies by not living up to the agreements that he had made with uh, individuals on purchasing and selling of CB sets and other various equipment. Customers told police that Chris would promise to send one model of CB radio, but after he received payment, would ship another lower-priced radio. Obviously, a number of these individuals were upset over this, and therefore it was necessary for the investigation to locate and interview these individuals in order to determine if that anger rose to the level where they would do such a uh, violent crime. With hundreds of customers, investigators now had hundreds of suspects. Investigators discovered that the package was shipped by the United Parcel Service from Mansfield, Ohio. The name and town on the return address were both fictitious. At the crime scene, investigators sifted through the debris looking for evidence. An extensive search was required. We are meticulously going through every room where any piece of evidence that we're looking for, a wire, a tool, a hex nut, we are taking sweepings and going room to room. Bomb experts say bombs are unique, that each bomber has a signature style. And the bomb that killed Chris Marquis had a signature all its own. One of the things that we knew from the murder scene was that small brass hex nuts had been included in the bomb that killed Chris Marquis. So the FBI and ATF agents in the search were looking for hex nuts that might be physically consistent with the hex nuts in the bomb. Investigators also found pieces of styrofoam used to pack the bomb, a piece of the battery used to detonate it, and they were able to identify the chemical makeup of the gunpowder used in the explosion. But all of these items were available in any hardware store or gun shop. The bombing death of Chris Marquis made the national news. The witness realized that he had information that was important to law enforcement. It was at that point that the cooperating witness contacted law enforcement to relay his information that he had. The informant told investigators that a long-distance truck driver in Indiana, Christopher Dean, had purchased a CB radio from someone through the internet and was angry about it. This witness informed the FBI that he was present in a discussion with Mr. Dean when he spoke of his problems with the sale of a CB radio and a young man in Vermont. There was information that he'd said he was going to come to Vermont and you know, beat up Mr. Markey. When questioned, Dean confirmed he had purchased a CB radio from Chris Markey for $400 and had been sent a cheaper model instead. Mr. Dean was very angered. Uh, at one time, his wife actually called Christopher Markey and uh, indicated that her husband was quite upset and maybe traveling to Vermont and that uh, he would not be um, very happy if he did. There was a lot of phone calls. And a lot of times I would answer the phone and he'd ask for my son. And Chris would say, I'm not here. You know, he'd give me the motion. He didn't want to answer the phone call. Sheila admitted her son didn't return Dean's money. But Dean denied sending the bomb. He had no prior criminal record and he lived in Indiana. The package had been shipped from Ohio. He was described as a very hardworking person, reliable, honest, and a very loving family. Uh, he, he had plenty of friends and neighbors 
who trusted him, who uh, thought he was uh, a generous, um, regular guy. Investigators wondered whether forensic evidence in Dean's home would contradict his story. I can't really believe that somebody would do this. Chris was my pride and joy. He was my youngest child. They say that you have to forgive. And because of my religion, I believe I do have to forgive. But I don't think I've come to that yet. Armed with a warrant, investigators searched Christopher Dean's home, their prime suspect in the bombing death of Chris Marquis. We are looking everywhere that any place a hex nut could be, a wooden clothespin, thumbtacks, batteries, any type of insulating materials, as well as taking sweepings from carpet, looking for powders, anything that may have held any type of explosive powders. In Christopher Dean's basement, they found hex nuts similar to those used in the fatal bomb. To find out if they were the same, analysts used a process known as plasma atomic emission spectroscopy. They took samples from the hex nuts found with the bomb and those found in Dean's house. These samples were dissolved in a neutral chemical solution, which was then vaporized at extremely high temperatures. Different components like zinc and copper will vaporize at different speeds, all of which is monitored by a computer. Investigators concluded the hex nuts had the same chemical makeup. Identical hex nuts from a metallurgical point of view were recovered from Mr. Dean's residence. They were stored in a container near his workbench where we alleged the bomb was constructed. In the rest of the house was even more evidence. Investigators found the same type of wiring used in the bomb's detonator. They found the same type of pipe used in the fatal bomb. And the same type of styrofoam packing material was discovered in Dean's garage. This pipe bomb used smokeless powder. One of the things we were looking for was powder like that. Now, interestingly enough, there was no container of powder found. But in the kitchen, Investigators found a small plastic funnel that looked like it might contain a clue. That funnel, we could visibly see that there appeared to have been some type of powder used in that. The powder was analyzed using a scanning electron microscope that uses X-rays to reveal its chemical components. That sample was compared to the powder found at the bomb scene. Both samples were smokeless gunpowder and both had a 17% concentration of nitroglycerin in addition to the stabilizing component nitrocellulose. The smokeless powder matched the smokeless powder from the murder bomb and from the smokeless powder we found inside his house. But there was a problem. All of these items in Dean's home were available at stores in every state in the country. There was nothing unique or unusual about the gunpowder, the pipe, or the hex nuts. Investigators knew that sometimes the tiniest piece of evidence is the most telling, so they return to the bomb scene. Among the thousands of pieces of debris, they found a mangled nine volt battery. With a magnifying glass, investigators saw a series of numbers and letters on the side of the battery. 3G24 G205. A call to the manufacturer revealed this was a lot number that identified the day and the assembly line on which the battery was assembled. Inside Christopher Dean's home, investigators found an open pack of the same brand of 9 volt batteries with one missing. The lot numbers on the unused batteries were the same as the one used to detonate the pipe bomb. And that lot number meant that those batteries were manufactured at the same day on the same line. Just when prosecutors thought their case against Dean would primarily be circumstantial, 
a computer forensic expert found even more evidence inside Chris Dean's computer. It was a file Dean thought he had deleted, but hadn't. Prosecutors found evidence that Christopher Dean ordered a CB radio from Chris Marquis and sent a check for $400. But Marquis sent a less expensive CB radio than the one Dean ordered. The motive for Mr. Dean's actions in this murder of Christopher Marquis appears to be, unfortunately, his extreme anger over the fact that uh, Christopher Marquis swindled him out of a $400 CB radio. There was one last item in Christine's home investigators needed to evaluate, his computer. A computer forensic analysis uncovered evidence that Dean had recently downloaded information on how to build a pipe bomb. If an investigator were looking for evidence of searches for pipe bomb material on the internet, uh, it is not difficult to locate, especially if the computer user himself is not savvy on how to cover his tracks. And on the hard drive of his computer, there was a copy or template of the label used on the box that held the pipe bomb with the same fictitious return address that was found on the pipe bomb package. Mr. Dean attempted to delete the file, but remnants of the file were still on the computer's hard drive. He probably thought he covered his tracks and deleted all the files. However, because he printed it, the computer generated a second file on the system for the printer, and that is what was found. It would be remarkable for anybody else to have made up the exact name and exact address that was contained on Christopher Dean's computer. I characterized this computer label as a computer fingerprint. It was conclusive in my mind that somebody had, that, that this bomb was associated with that house. Um, that somebody had created the address label used in this bomb at the Dean residence. Christopher Dean was arrested and charged with first degree murder. Prosecutors had plenty of evidence to prove Dean chose violence as a way to resolve his dispute with Chris Marquis. In making the bomb, Dean unwittingly used a nine volt battery which identified the date and the factory in which it was manufactured, a battery which matched the ones found in his home. Logs from Mr. Dean's trucking company indicated he was in Mansfield, Ohio on the day the fatal package was sent. We even went a step further than that. The witness at the UPS facility in Ohio identified Christopher Dean as the person who shipped that box. We were able to compare the handwriting on the UPS receipt with Mr. Dean's handwriting, and handwriting experts would say that it was the same person. And Dean had no idea he was dealing with a teenager. They communicated over the internet and a little bit over the telephone, so they'd never met each other. Um, Mr. Dean didn't know what Mr. Marquis looked like, didn't know he was a 17-year-old boy. In February of 2000, Christopher Dean pleaded guilty to first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. For Sheila Rockwell, there was little satisfaction in the sentence. She still bears the scars of the bomb that killed her son. She limps from the shrapnel that tore through her leg, and her hands will never recover from the blast. But mostly, she mourns the loss of her 17-year-old son. Why? Why would anybody ever do this over a CB radio? You know, if only I had known, I would try to, you know, reason with Dean. You know, pay him for the radio, send him back the radio, whatever the case may be. But it was just unbelievable that somebody that crazy would do something like that. Sitting here today, I still can't fathom how 
one person would be of a mindset that just because they got ripped off for a couple hundred bucks, that they'd want to kill somebody that they'd never seen before. For investigators, the case proved something that Christopher Dean never thought possible. He was convinced that since he'd never been to Vermont and he had never met Chris Marquis, that no one could tie him to the fatal bomb. But he never realized forensic science would identify him. The materials he used to build the bomb, the lot numbers on the batteries, and the fictitious name and address that was recovered from his computer left no doubt that he was the one who killed Chris Marquis. Well, we had a lot of evidence in this case, but the forensic evidence, to me, was the linchpin of the prosecution. And we not only had one piece of forensic evidence, but we had many, many different kinds of forensic evidence. It was just amazing the way that they had pinpointed the paper wrapper, the styrofoam, uh, the bomb, everything that he had, you know, had put in the bomb, the hex nuts, were all right back to the manufacturer. It, it was unbelievable that science was that good.